Yeah, like something new to me, maybe. Yeah, M2. I do record this one so we can see the outcome of our glass. That's why there's extra stuff rolling here today. So uh, it's mostly just going to be on screen eventually and then the uh, casting area. So, like I said, we'll be right back. Yeah. Does this he just pour out all everyone or whatever? Must be. Yeah. They must all be in the reading out there. Oh, I'm reading with the lab itself or whatever. Something's reading it. Oh, you're just two pages. It, that's what it sounds like. Oh, really? Unless it's, oh, you know what? I think he heats it. In. Like, not, he doesn't put it in a map for two days. He heats it like in a vacuum. <coughs> in a vacuum. Uh, like, dry it out or something. Oh, so you, yeah, if you get water in your glass, that's what makes it explode or something. Oh. We need to get this thing out. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm asking. 
No, it's for uh, it's self side. So I think part of it is like they have a park like you don't have a parking or whatever in your parking lot and like you would have a parking street so in the winter time you can like pass it to like the park somewhere. I think there's like a church right down the road. We do not All right, let's go ahead and get started here. So I've got uh, obviously a camera rolling here. Like I said, I'm gonna be wearing a microphone. There's actually a few people that uh, aren't able to make it here today. So we're uh, recording that so they can see the outcome and still make their report. Um, just verifying the health of the stream here and then we'll start. Looks like we're good to go. So today we're making glass, uh, as you know. So your batches were loaded uh, last night and they are currently baking out at 1150 Celsius. So definitely some nice radiant heat going there. Yeah, I know. 
You cook a hot dog up here, right? Just a. Uh... I never have, but we could. We should do that one year. I'm gonna bump up the uh, temperature to 1200, um, just so it's a little bit higher temperature, which will make a little lower viscosity during the pour. So the way this typically goes is uh, we'll go through a little bit more detail introduction than maybe what we typically do. Uh, since we haven't covered glass yet in lecture, uh, then we will pour the glass. Of course, it starts off very hot, so then we have to wait for that to cool in order to handle that. And so we'll be pouring that here. After it's poured, we'll watch two different videos that examine a, a glass in some different contexts of making art glass, glass blowing type applications, as well as bottle glass. Uh, more mechanized, similar process to what we've discussed in, in lecture. At that point, we'll then be able to start taking our measurements of the glass, and then eventually we'll put the glass on the light table over there and look at the internal stress of the glass. So that's uh, where we're headed, and all that takes about two and a half hours. So, But first, let's talk a bit about glass itself and what it's made from. So when you're looking at a uh, beaker of sand, you don't necessarily think about its crystal structure. One of the reasons that we do alum at the beginning is it starts us thinking down that process, that sand is like the first week's alum that was such a, a fine grain structure, just looks like white powder. Well, that's, that's true also of, of sand. It's just small grains of silicon dioxide. It can, under the right conditions, grow into these large quartz points there's uh, some mines in particular down in um, Arkansas that are known for producing large spikes of quartz. Chemically, it's identical. It's just the spikes are single crystal versus the sand, which has many, many small crystalline grains all crushed and randomized there. If we were to look at the atomic placement in quartz, silica, SiO2, silicon dioxide, all those are the same thing. It can also be called flint. Flint is uh, a common name for quartz. This is what we would see. Some people make the mistake of thinking that SiO2 is a molecular formula just like H2O, but it's not. H2O is a water molecule and it exists as an oxygen bound to two hydrogen. Silicon dioxide, SiO2, is a formula, not a molecule. It's a formula because what that tells us is that in the bulk silicon dioxide, there is a ratio that's conserved, one silicon to every two oxygen. But in reality, they're all bonded to each other in a grain of material, and there's actually millions of them, billions of them in each of these crystalline grains. But notice the motif, the pattern. The white is silicon, each silicon is bonded to four oxygen, and each oxygen is bonded to two silicon, forming bridges between them. So that two to four ratio simplifies to SiO2 based on whole integer values. And so this is just a little, you know, idealized piece of silica. If we were to examine the base unit for the repeating pattern, it would be the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. So it's called a tetrahedron, and we'll dig into this a lot in the next chapter, but it's got four triangular faces, one, two, three, and four from the bottom. Tetra, four, tetrahedron. Uh, very regular in the parent quartz crystal. These all pack in and form the superstructure. There are some different depictions of silica that you may encounter. So we'll just kind of walk you through what's called the like the reduced form. So this is more laborious to draw than a bunch of tetrahedra touching on the corners. It's representing the same thing. This is suggesting that at the center of every little pyramid that you see there, there is a silicon atom dead center. And every time the points touch, that represents a bridging oxygen atom. 
different ways to say the same thing, essentially. So that's the parent material, silica. We took 90 grams of silica, added 50 grams of sodium carbonate, and 25 grams of calcium carbonate. And so it's still a majority silica, but there's a lot of other stuff now that's going to be in that glass. Why does glass form? We mentioned this in the last chapter on polar covalent bonds. Notice that percent ionic character for silica is almost dead center. This is covalent. This is ionic. This is confused. Am I covalent? Am I ionic? I've always wondered. I never know. So silicon dioxide actually can behave like both, depending on what it's presented with. So 50% ionic character. So let's identify the mechanistic step of what the sodium carbonate, washing soda, soda ash, all those are synonyms for the same exact thing. Now you might look at this and be like, we added sodium carbonate. Why is this sodium oxide? Sodium carbonate converts into sodium oxide in the furnace. In the process, it gives off carbon dioxide gas. And so on the initial thermal ramp, once this hits 800 degrees, 900 degrees, 1,000 degrees Celsius, which is around 2,000 Fahrenheit, for those of you tooled in Fahrenheit, uh, it forms a skin of melted glass, and then bubbles start to form, and it actually blows bubbles that then collapse down into the crucible as we are giving off carbon dioxide. So imagine I have the formula here, NaCO3, sodium carbonate. During that thermal agitation, the CO3 can convert to an oxide and throw off a CO2. That's the remaining third oxygen that stays as sodium oxide. So the carbonate has left, or the carbon dioxide has left, leaving sodium oxide. So in our diagram earlier, let's imagine we choose a single silicon-oxygen-silicon bridge to consider the reaction. And this happens a trillion times over, you know, trillions of trillions of times. So here's our silicon-oxygen bridge. So how does a sodium oxide or other flux disrupt that bond? Well, this shows the transition state. The oxide will interact ionically with this silicon and cause one of the bond electrons, because remember bonds are worth two, one bonding electron goes up and interacts with one of the extra electrons on that oxide and forms a new bond. And it also leaves a residual negative one charge. This oxygen is still in a uh, two minus oxidation state, but one of those is interacting covalently, and the other one is interacting ionically as a negative one charge. So we split that bond, and then we end up with two pendant oxides that are capped by the sodium ions to keep charge balance. The net result, these silica that were bonded together are now able to move and flow and migrate away from each other in that melt. And so the crystal's been disrupted, and now it's going to turn into a glass, because as we cool this down, this bond doesn't reform. It's going to stay associated with the sodium now that's disrupted that bond. Because this is a single-charged alkali metal that associates with every individual oxide, this is just considered a flux. Now, the word flux shows up in a lot of different contexts. You may have used a flux when you are soldering metal. Anybody ever used a flux? You know, you put flux on copper pipe. That keeps it from oxidizing in the torch flame or electrical solder, if you're into that. I do an awful lot of that, it seems. Uh, the flux prevents oxidation. That's one definition. Helps substances like glass to melt. That's another context. You also have flux in a classical physics sense as a field, magnetic flux lines through a wire loop. That's another term, multiple definitions of flux. So this is the melting aid, obviously. 
but don't think that this is directly related to metallic counter-oxidizer fluxes. But the good news is this flux in this context is identical to the definition used in the blast furnace for making slag out of gang. We add calcium carbonate as a flux. So sodium flux is only acting as a flux where calcium flux is actually a flux stabilizer and a flux and a stabilizer. Why the distinction? Well, same story, calcium carbonate throws off a carbon dioxide and makes a calcium oxide. The calcium oxide ponies up to the silicon oxygen bridge. This is the transition state. Same thing happens, half bond, pendant oxide, residual pendant oxide. But now notice that the calcium, since it's a two plus, still forms an ionic bridge in place of the polar covalent bond that previously was there. So there's still a residual association. So that adds a bit of strength that otherwise would have been lost if it was purely a sodium flux. The calcium adds additional stability. So the reason that you don't make window glass out of just sodium fluxed silica is that it's weaker and it's more susceptible to water attack, water spotting, clouding over time, uh, because you start to dissolve the outer layer of the glass. But calcium, just because it has that extra charge, is able to bridge these ionic pendant oxides and hold the system together, still disrupted order-wise, but hold it together better than the sodium flux would by itself. So higher valence or higher charged cations lead to greater strength in the glass and higher viscosity. End result is that the ordered silica structure that's on the left gets disrupted by the ionic ad additives and the tetrahedron still exists, that's still there, but the translatable pattern where this is the same as this is the same as this has been completely disrupted and will never form a crystal again. It's been turned into a glass. Uh, so that's the basics of glass formation. Questions on that? Does that make sense? It's kind of intuitive if you wrap your mind around it and try to like go through the thought experiment. So we introduced this, of course, last time, but uh, this just gives you some extra examples. Um, we're doing a, a subset of these today, but depending upon the metal oxide that we dope into the glass, we get different colors. Where does that oxide exist? Well, it will essentially replace one of these ionic centers as a metal ion, and typically the metal, let's imagine it's copper, the copper will attach to usually six different oxygen atoms in that glass and coordinate and hold on to six nearest neighbors and that little pocket holding that metal absorbs light, absorbs red, which makes it look blue. Depending upon the identity of the metal, it changes the way it absorbs light we could get into how that works. It's called a uh, metal ligand electron transfer interaction. Essentially, it just can absorb those wavelengths of light that originally uh, the glass itself could not. Remember that when you see a color, it's the complementary color that actually is absorbed and converted to heat in the glass. We'll talk a lot more about that in, I think, three chapters. But cobalt looks blue because it's the, the substance is absorbing yellows and oranges and leaves blue. Some of these look red because violet and blue is being absorbed. So anyway, we are going to be looking at cobalt and, oxy and uh, iron, uh, copper. We've got examples of that. Um, we've got examples of chrome and manganese. Some of these colors, I've been working on this for a while. It's really hard to get these to work. I've always wanted to have reds, but red glass is difficult. 
I've even made some gold additives and uh, I got it to work maybe about 5% instead of 100%. The old cathedral windows with red uh, did use colloidal gold in them. Um, it's a difficult one, so still working on that. Oh yeah, yeah. So once there was an artisan that knew the secret to making it work right, apparently they had their, you know, their ticket to stable employment. They could make their red glass recipe. And so it's not like it can't be done, but it's really difficult to do it right and to dial in the exact composition and temperature history to get it to work. And so I haven't like made it my full-time job, but the several times that I have attempted were, you know, not perfect. I didn't get the bright red I was looking for. So, but I'll keep at it, you know, give me another 50, 60 years, we'll get there. So, but doping metals to make colors. The colors change. This isn't your group. This is several years ago, but should look familiar. This all was purified silica. We've instit instituted using a lot of different sand materials. It makes it look less uh, like bread flour looks more granular. Uh, but the appearance of the precursor oxide color will be completely changed. So what was red in iron turns into a light green. Uh, chrome actually retains its color. It starts off light pastel green and turns into deep green. Uh, but there isn't always a relationship between the initial color and the final color. I, I did take pictures of your group as well, so I will post those on Canvas, uh, so you'll have access to similar shots uh, as those. And so that's a uh, part of the intro. So then, get to the right place. Uh, this is the actual document itself. Let me highlight the things that you'll need to, uh, to do here. So the discussion that I have presented so far is also here for you to review. Uh, it talks about the flux and the carbonate. That's the reaction that I mentioned right there, sodium carbonate to sodium oxide, also carbon dioxide is a byproduct. Uh, but this we haven't talked about yet. Viscosity. Most of us have an association mentally that viscosity has to do with thickness. But what I find is that some people's logic is reversed. High viscosity means thick. Low viscosity is easy to pour or thin. So water is low viscosity. Corn syrup or honey is high viscosity, but not the highest. You know, tar is about as high a viscosity as is practical to talk about viscosity. Very, very thick. Uh, the viscosity of molten glass is dependent upon temperature and its composition. But all glass has a similar story. Now, this is a low melt point glass. This would probably be a highly fluxed lead glass. For our glass, this midpoint here would be at around 1100 or 1200 Celsius to get that good softening point, lower viscosity. But for every glass, it has a similar curve, it just shifts upwards or downwards. There's a concept question dealing with lithium flux, sodium flux, potassium flux. Lithium is a more active flux and a more potent positive charge. Sodium's intermediate. Potassium is a bigger ion. It's lower in the table. And so it's a more sluggish flux. All of them make a stable glass, but recognize that if this is the curve for sodium, the lithium curve would have been similar, but at a lower transition temperature. And potassium would have been a similar curve, but at a higher temperature. So the end result, though, is if we've got a static pore temperature, the same pore temperature of 1,200 degrees, the lithium would have been at an even lower viscosity and would pour like water or closer to it. 
sodium, thick syrup, potassium, really thick syrup because it might only be here. So at a single pore temperature, where that temperature intersects the particular glass's composition uh, softening curve like this uh, is what determines its viscosity during the pour. Lithium flux is hard on furnaces. Uh, this is the furnace I used for, for years before, and you can see that um, this upper ceramic is actually sagging. Part of the reason for that is there have been several years where I did use some lithium flux, and it actually vaporizes and softens the interior of the furnace. And this one sags by, by gravity a little bit there. So hard to get parts for this one. So I'm entertaining, do I replace it or do I fabricate my own heating elements? Still wrestling with that. But the end result is sodium is a more predictable and easy to use glass. Potassium is, is fine, but the pour temperature would need to be about 1400. The problem with potassium is that when I pour it at this temperature, it's too tight of a glass and it always shatters. So we'll talk about exploding glass here in a moment. It's exciting, wear your goggles. Um, we only had three that went off on Tuesday, so. How does this play out, practically speaking, with our observations? Well, this is a simulated data showing the thickness of the bead of glass as it exits the crucible. So if it's a low viscosity glass, it pinches into a thin stream. If it's a medium viscosity, a bit thicker, if it's super high viscosity, you'll notice I pour the crucible and then it's like, you're waiting, you're waiting, and then this drop is funnel like blob and it comes out much slower with a much thicker column of molten glass. It's not quantitative, but it's a qualitative assessment of viscosity when pouring at 1200 degrees. You'll notice all this is tooled to 1150. I've bumped it up because I think my old numbers were based on this sensor and I think this sensor was actually running a little bit low, meaning I was calling it 1150, but in reality it was probably 1200 because when I pour at 1200, it's just a little too sluggish, or 1150 is a little too sluggish on the new furnace. So dialing those differences in, it's a fairly minor difference, but um, this calls out 1150, we're gonna be pouring at 1200. So you might wanna make a note of that. Uh, so then anyway, the end result are these pucks of glass. So keep an eye on viscosity during pour, and then after it's cooled, we can see the fingerprint of viscosity based on the size of the disc. Again, it's a qualitative assessment. We're trying to make it a semi-quantitative assessment of viscosity. So all of our batches have the same mass. They're all gonna be poured at the same temperature at basically the same angle. And so the recovery from the crucible and the degree of spread on the steel is going to be indicative of that pour viscosity during the pouring of the glass. So for a standard flux amount, notice same silica, different sodium carbonate. This one is what we probably targeted, but by adding less flux, you end up with a marginally smaller disc of glass because it was slower to pour higher viscosity. So do we understand the fingerprint of viscosity? So the lower viscosity spreads out to a larger diameter. The higher viscosity stands up and doesn't spread as far. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of those uh, wetting experiments. Now that's similar, but a little different uh, because that's not viscosity related, that's surface energy related. Uh, but it's a similar effect in that you can determine parameters based on the appearance of that drop. Uh, now these are gonna be you know, bigger, like glass hockey pucks. That would be exciting. Um, yeah, kind of that. 
I mentioned the lithium sodium potassium series. So at the same pore temperature, 1150, 1200, you can see that lithium poured into a much larger disk because it was a lower viscosity. That one also happened to shatter. We pieced it back together, Humpty Dumpty style. But larger diameter, low viscosity. Medium diameter, average viscosity. Small diameter, high viscosity during the pour. So there's questions dealing with viscosity and diameter and fluxes, and so you can use these images to answer those questions at the end of the lab. Um, uh, so, these are all just there for example. Uh, we made variations that are similar to many of these, but not identical because we kind of fabricated our own uh, this year. You, you did uh, turn this page in. I've got those ready to hand back to you. You may have noticed I PDF these and um, posted them. Oh, one thing, uh, whoever had batch L, batch L, if you still have your paper, if you could give me that, our first glass, I have no idea what it is. Uh, so if you've got that paper, let me know and we'll take a picture of it and add it to the, the, the spreadsheet because some of the questions are gonna require that you take a look at those compositions. So this first table, you put in the letter, the flux, which in this case is always sodium. We're going to assess viscosity. You get to choose how you do that. Is it low, medium, high? Is it one through 10? I like one through 10, try to semi-quantitatively assign uh, a viscosity rating. Diameter, you can use a ruler. If you've got calipers, feel free to use those. Find kind of a rough average of diameter. Uh, and whether or not it shatters. Um, a, pro a couple of them very well could, but just to um, let you know what that's like. Um, when glass explodes in this context, it's not quite like a grenade with shrapnel that's traveling at the speed of sound that goes right through you. You know, it's not that kind of explode. Uh, it, it's more of a tension in the glass. And so the, the disc will shatter and then spread outward. And so you get this, this spray of glass chunks that just kind of radiate in a fan in this direction. There can be a few little pieces that go whipping into the air, so that's why eye protection is, is definitely a must. It's unpredictable. Uh, no, but it's related. So Prince Rupert's drop is the extreme example of this that actually does go off like a grenade but the, the fragments are low enough density that you don't die, you know? But that is the same idea. It's internal tension in the glass that catastrophically is released. In our case, it's a disc and it's a, it's a ring tension that splits and springs outward. And it's, it's spooky when you see this happen at first because it's, laying, it's sitting there motionless and then all of a sudden there's motion, there's energy. There's sound and it's clearly moving. So where was that energy? Well, the energy was stored in bonds that were not at their equilibrium bond length, which sounds boring, but really what that means is that it wants to be here, but it's been forced to bond here or here because it's all jammed up with neighboring atoms. And so that you can view as a loaded spring and so it's like spring tension locked into that, that material. Well, we wouldn't be surprised if we saw a spring launch a, a ball bearing. You know, yeah, it's classical, classical mechanics. Well, what happens is there's some kind of a rupture at the surface microscopically uh, that then allows those bonds to spring open and that force was stored as spring 
spring-like tension in that glass as it's relieved. With Ru Prince Rupert's drop, it's a higher tension field, and interestingly, you can shoot that with a bullet and it still won't explode because of the ridiculous hardness. However, the susceptibility is the tail. And if you just nip that tail, it creates this tiny little crack that then cascades and propagates until this whole thing in like, what is it, half of 1,000? It's like, how many milliseconds? 0.5 milliseconds? Fast. It's crazy fast. It just ceases to exist. And it's like it goes from being an object, a bulb of glass with a tail, to just being completely shattered. And there's some high-speed video and lots of cool stuff online. There is a video by Smarter Every Day that I reference in the last question where you'll take a look at Prince Rupert's drop and apply it to what we're, we're talking about here. But that's the story on the shatter effect. Then there's uh, this one for composition. I made it too easy on you because I posted in um, Canvas a spreadsheet or a PDF of a spreadsheet. Hopefully this will be legible. It's pretty small. In theory, if you download this and zoom in, you can actually read it because this doesn't doesn't look like it's copying terribly well, but I've put in all of your compositions, your pre-batch weight, your post-batch theoretical weight. We then put in the mass of the oxides and verify this is correct. You know, I, I, I may have not transposed your handwriting properly, but we put in our masses and then it takes this mass, converts it to the metal only. This is the mass of the metal plus oxygen converts it to the, the metal mass. And over here in the little yellow box, it calculates percent metal ion in batch. So let's pick, oh, I need to correct these. Don't go off of this row. Go off of the row where this is L2, M2. Sorry about that, I didn't see that it repeated there. Uh, but this would be batch M2. Batch weight 133, 2.5% iron 2 plus or 3 plus is your ion concentration, whatever this batch would be. Uh, we've got copper and iron, 0.12%, 0.52%. This is here so you can relate the color depth that you see to the actual ion and concentration responsible for it. And you can see in our group that we, uh, we actually picked a lot of chrome. We picked a fair amount of cobalt. Uh, got a couple copper examples, some iron, but only one manganese. So this will be a nice light purple. Uh, so there's a sampling of some different colors, but I, I, can, you know, I can foresee the future. There's a lot of green in our future uh, today. So this is the resource that's posted for you. And I'll eventually update that spreadsheet so it's uh, got the correct labels. You can see the labels over here don't correlate to labels over here. So that's the issue. Anyway, so there's that. And then some wrap-up questions that if you were listening, I basically gave you a lot of these answers. This entire video today, including this, will be posted to the playlist. And so you've got that to fall back on. So now you're an expert on the basics of glass. So next up, we need to actually pour the glass. So I'm gonna need some assistance. I'm gonna need five volunteers to help out with this process because it is a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of a process up here. So let me describe those jobs here quickly. So I'll go through the roles real quick, and then we'll take volunteers after those. And if there's no volunteers, well, we're gonna institute a, dra a draft. So uh, the first one is what I call sort of the, the MC or the, uh, you know, the, the coordinator up here. I've got a, a diagram that shows how they're loaded in the furnace. And I'm correlating that with your batch recipes so I can call out 
the composition before I pour it so we can relate that. So that person can kind of sit or stand here. Uh, the next one, if we look at the workflow, is the door. So this person stands here and uh, has a, probably a thermal glove. I've got some thermal gloves and some welding gloves. Uh, and you basically just pull straight out, lift up. I grab the crucible and then without catching yourself on fire, which actually could happen, uh, you close that. The force is basically out and it sort of lifts itself up. So it does get you up close and personal with the furnace, uh, but that's the motion, just kind of up and down. And as I'm exiting with the crucible, with the tongs, you go ahead and close the furnace so it preserves the heat. Otherwise, it just bleeds all the heat out and it's not all the same each time. So there's the door. Next up is the torch. And this torch was actually giving us some problems on Tuesday, so hopefully that won't repeat. It's just a standard propane torch, but this one has a little piezo that uh, is supposed to ignite it and it was acting unpredictably. So a really slow pull. So gas, spark. If you pull too quick, it's really hit or miss. So gas, spark. That looks like it's uh, working now, hopefully. So as I'm pouring the glass, imagine my finger is the glass. I'm not gonna torch my finger, but you bring the torch in really close. And at the tip of the flame, is, uh, come on now, I'm gonna drop you on the floor. Right here is the uh, bright inner cone. That's the hottest part of the flame. So that's the part that you need to be touching the hot glass to keep the bead of glass the hottest. And then once I remove the crucible, I walk around this way and you're gonna then fire polish that surface to get the little defect from where I pull the glass uh, away with the crucible to flatten that down into a nice smooth disc. So you fire polish that, and then I'll like, you know, say it looks good, and then you can step back. Um, but that's sort of like operating right here. Another thing you gotta be careful of to prevent the shattering issue is that I pour them sequentially in rows, and when you're doing the second row, what sometimes happens is that the flame angles towards the previous prepared row, and it heats one edge of that glass that's already cooled a bit, hotter than the other, and those will shatter because they're getting secondary heating from, from the flame. So part of your dance up here has to be angling the flame as you're doing this process uh, away so that you're not hitting the previous poured glass with the flame. So that's a interesting job. I recommend wearing welding gloves so it's a little easier to actuate, but still gives you a little bit of protection from the heat, it does get pretty crazy up here. I'll also have some hot crucibles you have to be careful not to catch your arm on fire with. So there's that. Um, the next job is the stamp. And so all of our compositions are ending in two. So the first one is L2. So you would take these dies that are you know, the same that you might be using for leather working or stamping metal or stamping wood and you convince yourself that it's the right orientation. I typically press it on my, my skin to see a momentary imprint that, yep, I want it to say L2. Um, for spring semesters, it would be 2L, and fall semesters, L2. That way I can keep track of um, all the different batches and know when they were made. Uh, so always ending in two, L2, M2, etc. So that person usually wears a glove on one hand. A nitrile glove is enough because it's just momentary. Uh, but if this is the disc of glass, you figure out that orientation and right here in the lower part, you just press gently into that pliable glass and leave an imprint that then we can verify later is the right batch. And so that gets you up close and personal with the glass, but in the event that one shatters, you're like right there in the front line. So, but eye protection, you'll be fine. I've never had anybody get injured in this process. Hopefully that will continue for the rest of time. So the next uh, 
person is the fireman. I've never had to use this, but I always, uh, you know, decide to be ready. You don't have to stand. I had one guy one year that as I start working, he already had it pointed at me. And it's like, listen, I, it doesn't have to, I don't think I'm going to burst into flame because it was, it was like one of those. It just needs to be sitting here and in the event that something odd happens, uh, there's just somebody who knows, step in, hose it down. Uh, so there's kind of sort of squeamish about fire extinguishers around here because the claim is we don't give you fire extinguisher training, so you're not qualified to use it. So in the event of a fire, we want you to safely and calmly exit the building. I'm like, well, what if a fire is blocking the exit? We don't want you to fight the fire. We want you to safely and calmly exit the building. What if a student is on fire? We don't want you to fight the fire. We want you all to safely and calmly exit the building. What if I'm on fire safely and So you get the idea. No matter what, it's the flow chart that always leads to the same exact uh, endpoint. So the only, the only fire extinguisher that we have official access to is out in the hall, but I always bring an extra one just in case. So fire extinguisher training, really complex. I'm not gonna pull the trigger, but this is how it works. P, it's the word pass. P, pull the pin. Aim at the base of the flame. Not the flame itself, at the base of the flame. Squeeze and sweep side to side. So it's the word pass to make it easy to remember. Pull the pin, aim, squeeze, and sweep. There you go, fire extinguisher training. Now in an official fire extinguisher train, they usually build a giant fire out in like a parking lot or somewhere and have people take turns hosing it down. Just imagine. So anybody ever had fire extinguisher training? Did they use the word pass? Yep, they're all the same. So that's, that's fire extinguisher training. Like I said, it's unlikely, but eventually it's hot enough that yeah, clothes catch on fire. It's bad. So, and then, was that five? We had, yes. so that's it. So who would like to be the coordinator, the MC? Would I get a volunteer for that? Anybody? Anybody want to help out there? What's that? You want to be the door person. That's fine. Maybe we'll come back to this one. Who would like to be the torch person? Anybody? Torch? Okay. Uh, who would like to stamp the glass? Like to stamp the glass? Okay. Who would like to be the fire individual? You just have to stand there. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the coordinator. Anybody would like to help out with just keeping me straight on which crucible we're pulling? Is that really that unpopular of a job? Bueller? Bueller? Any? Okay, thank you. Uh, just, just because as I'm talking, I want to make sure I'm talking about the right batch. So I think that's, that's everybody. So I do have to wear a shiny suit as if it's a foundry. This isn't just for making a fashion statement, although I know I look good. Uh, but uh, the radiant heat from the uh, furnace is sufficient to catch things on fire. We did, I had a skeptic one year, it was like, I don't, I don't, I don't think so, Dr. Ray, it's not that hot, is it? And so we uh, took, we took his, uh, his arm and we, no, we, uh, <laughs> we uh, took a sheet of paper and held it like this, and you just crack open the door a little bit, and it's like one, two, it's flaming. You know, that's a lot of radiant heat uh, shooting out of that thing. So this uh, does keep my arms from bursting into flame. So let's go ahead and uh, get our goggles on and take our places here, and we will uh, cast some glass. So let me dial in the uh, front plate here. Excuse me. And so feel free to get where you uh, can see everything. So this area up in here is kind of the, the main zone. Um, that looks pretty good. 
Um, we will eventually have crucibles with uh, strands of glass. Try to avoid the temptation to touch fiberglass. I know that you may be familiar with fiberglass installation. It feels soft. The problem with this is these are more like glass needles. So they bend surprisingly a lot for what they are, but when you least expect it, they break and snap back straight. And so it's even happened to me once. It wasn't too bad, but there was a professor once that got a piece of glass embedded in their finger and had to get it surgically removed because you're like showing, see, fiberglass can be flexible. And then all of a sudden it shatters and goes straight and impales your finger and sometimes leaves little pieces of glass inside. So respect the fiberglass, don't touch it. I'll eventually chunk off the uh, excess in the glass bin and then the crucibles at that point are safe to touch, but you gotta be careful. There can be little pieces adhered to the side that, uh, that get you. All right, so you probably want the, the welding, welding gloves. Uh, let me grab these. And so usually the fire can stand here and if you could stand here right here, that way We'll set it up like, like this actually. So you can work off this diagram. We unload left, right, center, left, right, center, left, right, center, and just kind of work our way zigzagging back through. Yeah, that's fine. Just, I'd say just a thin line, just to not obscure. Um, so batch L, did anybody have that batch L? Okay, could I see your, your batch record? Okay, we'll, we'll give this back to you at the, or do you? I thought we turned in the batch record, but um, yeah, we don't know. Oh, so it's not in here? No, and I picked up the folder. Oh, okay. But you do have the recipe? Yeah, I'll do that. Perfect. That's all we need. So we'll get that back to you here in a minute. Maybe it's still here in the lab somewhere, and I just didn't find it, but uh, don't think it's in the stack. So this first one is... The Fisher silica. So this is a high purity starting material. Uh, we've got the sodium carbonate flux. We added crushed limestone and 0.24 grams of copper oxide. So this should be a nice, a nice blue with a hint of iron impurity from the limestone. But uh, definitely gonna be in the uh, blue genre of color. At least that's what we expect. All right, so I'm pulling from front. Uh, you're just kind of pulling right towards me. And so go ahead and get a feel for that. It's been acting kind of bad. So sometimes this dial also gets too far in the upward position. So it looks like I need to get a new torch, huh? So that's weird. Let me try. It's working just a minute ago, so. Yeah, I saw a minute ago. It's like there's something about the little spring switch in there that it, it's a little quartz crystal that gets hit with a little mass and it's called the piezoelectric effect. It induces a voltage that's actually several thousand volts and it jumps, jumps through the space of the torch zone. So uh, you kind of push on the button with a not quite just in, there's a slight down vector to the side. It seems like that seems to work. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll try to make it reproducible. Uh, so, all right. And so as soon as I start pouring, you can move in and start flaming the, uh, the bead of glass and then fire polish what's left, so. All right, so this is L2. We're ready. All right. I was trying to avoid that uh, piece of unmelted batch. Hit it from this side to get that to pull in a little bit. 
hit that blob on the edge, try to get it to pull in a little bit. That one's going to be a problem. All right, that looks good. Go ahead and uh, stamp it away from uh, the little uh, blob on the edge. Well, we better hurry. Yep, just uh, in the in the orange zone. It might not go now. There we go. We're good. Okay. So the problem is that little defect on the side it looks like a chunk of unmelted something. That's a problem. So this one probably will eventually shatter. But we have a few minutes, so that's exciting. Uh, but the problem is that there's a chunk of, looks like uh, sodium carbonate perhaps, but there's a, a piece that must have been a, uh, a clump of material. Uh, the stress field is high around the edge. And so because there's dissimilar materials, it focuses that stress and makes it susceptible to cracking right there. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and call out a, a millimeter measurement on that one since uh, it might not be around when we measure it later. So it's a nice color though. So yeah, it's a nice, nice color. So see if I can't prevent melting the, uh, yeah, we're right around 59 millimeters, it looks like. It actually is starting to melt. So it's 59 to 60, it's right around 60 millimeters, hot plastic smell. So, all right, we'll keep an eye on that one, uh, but uh, kind of worried about him. So next up, we've got M2, and M2 is... Uh, Mason sand, so impure sand. We got some alumina that often tightens the glass, makes it a little bit uh, slower to pour. Washing soda, calcium carbonate, and then five grams of iron oxide. So this one's definitely gonna have a heavy iron signature. But I wonder if the alumina is enough to tighten up the glass and make it pour a little bit slower than this one. So we'll pour right here for that one. Yep. So that blue color will deepen as it cools. So, Let me know when you're ready. yep, we're ready. So really hit that area, try to get it to flatten out where the string of glass was. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so then you can move in and stamp from whatever side. That looks good. And so the heat will eventually get to be quite, quite a bit. And so I find those blue gloves actually knock it down just enough that you're not uh, toasting your fingers. Yeah, those would probably work too. Um, nitrile though, is you need more dexterity with uh, those those dies and so it's it's quick enough that you usually don't run into too much problems with those so this one definitely is a dark a lot darker glass try to break off the bee stinger there that thing's pretty wicked so watch your eyes for a second pelting people with shrapnel. Yeah, there we go. All right, so that one is super dark at the moment. It might lighten up a bit. I know you mentioned in the last one. Yeah, there's also some speckles of aluminum oxide that didn't melt completely either. That's also not a terribly good sign. So um, we'll see. So we'll pour this next one right there, kind of close, uh, but Keep your, we'll, we'll watch out for those two. Those could be a, a problem. Uh, right, so the sound that you're hearing is, is called crazing. And crazing is the process of little cracks that are forming inside 
the glass layer of the crucible. Uh, it's due to differential shrink rates. So the coefficient of thermal expansion of glass is different than ceramic. So as those shrink at different rates, once the glass is hard enough that it can no longer flex, it actually has to crack to accommodate that stress of differential shrink. And so when you hear that sound, I actually feel a little jolt in the crucible tongs as those m microscopic molecular or atomic springs are being relieved. And so that's, uh, that's called crazing. And eventually there'll be a chorus of those sounds coming from all these cooling crucibles. Yep, so. Yep, you can you can really hear it. So, I can see it. right, you'll see cracks forming down in there. It's kind of unexpected, but very common. All right, next up is N2, pulling from the middle. It looks like. So this one has a lot of borate, 7.9 of a Gersley borate. That's going to make a low melt point glass. So we're expecting a much larger disc this time. Um, Wondering if I got enough real estate there. Maybe I'll pour this one here. Uh, so we'll, we'll focus right there for this next one. So borate, 84 grams beach sand. So that's the North Shore Lake Michigan sand, 49 grams sodium carbonate, 24 crushed limestone with 0.015 cobalt oxide. So that's a deep violet blue. But the borate, we're expecting a larger disc. So keep an eye on the viscosity during this one. All right, let's 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 go ahead. So pulling from the middle. You see how easily that came out? It, it was a distinctly lower viscosity glass there. And look at the size of the bead exiting the, uh, the crucible. It's it's different. So borates are often added as a melt aid to uh, lower that viscoelastic range, and that certainly came through right there. All right, that looks good. So go ahead and stamp. Does that the gloves make it a little easier on you? I mean, radiant heat is uh, pretty incredible. You can see I'm making some fiberglass here, so I'll try to keep that in check. There it went. So that one actually was the first one to go. So what I usually do for those, I should have got that measurement, shouldn't I? Want, want, Dr. Ray. Uh, yeah, they were similar. So I got to keep my eye on uh, that blue one. I don't want to get my head down there and then it throws hot glass and sets my hair on fire again. Who would want that, right? Yeah, so these usually don't crack too much more. There can still be a little bit. This is a camel hair brush and now I smell burning camel hair. That's exciting. Yeah, so this, this will be put to the playlist so that way we'll be able to slow down that shatter and see it in uh, slow motion. Yay. Yeah. We usually do that at the end so you can actually see how fast it was really is one way to put it. So, um, so because it shattered, you often have to like put a little asterisk that it, you know, is, well, that was hot. We're actually melting into the, uh, melting into the uh, dustpan there. In theory, it can be remelted and recast, but I, I usually don't, but it could. Uh, so yeah, if, for ones that shatter and it's not possible to get a measurement, then you just don't worry about it. Um, so we'll clear the area of those little particles that will end up on the bottom of later batches. 
And the good thing about that one was that it made fairly large chunks and not a lot of uh, spread. So, it's easier to glue it back together. well, if you were going to glue it, if 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 it was critical to reprocess that, I would remelt it, cast it, and then probably try to anneal it to stabilize the glass. But it's actually kind of part of the process for us to see what happens when glass shatters like this, since we'll also be talking about internal stress. So. All right, next up, we'll pour this one here. Be careful not to get too much flame on this one since I've been messing around for too long. Um, so composition O. Purified silica, 27 grams, 59 or 60 grams of beach sand. So this is uh, two sources of silica. 49 grams sodium carbonate, 24 grams of dolomite. So dolomite is an, a mixed calcium magnesium carbonate. So a little bit more complex. 0.2 copper and one gram of iron. So that's kind of an interesting batch, a lot going on there. Um, so it's, it's gonna be a greenish tinted blue. So it'll be, it'll be different than this one, but tilted more uh, green. You know, we may, we may have stabilized it enough with that fire polishing. So I still think it's, it's a, there's a fairly good chance that it's still gonna shatter, but uh, who knows? It's unpredictable. So composition O2, and we're pulling from the left, okay. Let's go for it. Maybe angle it straight out. Yeah, that's good, right like that. All right, that looks pretty good. All right, and we're stamped. So we're just trying to get that into a place where it's not going to get knocked over. Um, should be fine. Okay, so that definitely at the moment has the iron green. Another interesting effect is if you look at the top of this, there's a, a copper metallic blush on the surface. That's due to uh, carbon monoxide in the torch flame actually reducing some of the copper ions into copper metal particles. And those show up as a surface layer that's really thin, but you get a little bit of a copper mirror. Eventually, if this one survives, you can hold it up and look through it and you won't really see any copper particle because it's just in reflection, but not so much transmission. And there's a little bit of that effect, effect here too. You can see a little copper blush on that one. So, um, uh, I'm not really economizing my space very well today, so, um, we'll probably go ahead and do this one here, and then I'll try to get three, and then we'll finish them out back there, but we'll, we'll cast up here closer for that one. So, composition P, uh, 85 of the North Shore Beach Sand, 50 sodium carbonate, 25 calcium, 5 grams of borate, 0.1 cobalt, point, uh, 0.01 cobalt, 0.01 chrome. So that's dark blue and dark green, but at medium input, plus borate. So it's going to be closer to this size, but hopefully kind of like a, it's green and dark blue. It makes brown, right? I think it'll be brown. Yeah. We had one year, I don't know, 
how it happened, but everybody ended up making glass that looked like color scheme for real tree camouflage. <laughs> it was all dark greens and dark browns, and when they were on the uh, light table, eventually it was like, this is like the real tree glass collection. It was kind of surprising. You should look back at those recipes, but uh, P2, pulling from the right. To make a camouflage stained glass for the cathedral in the woods. That's real high class Wisconsin style. Looks good. So sometimes you have to wait for the glass to solidify enough to free the, uh, the tongs here. There we go. That's just throw a piece at you? Okay, didn't go in your glove, did it? That is the downfall of uh, welding gloves is they're open enough up at the top that you can get stuff down inside, which is not good for you, so. Okay, so we'll shoot this one right here. We'll try to get three. Definitely at the moment looking brown. That chrome is unusual in that it starts off brown but then hits about five or 600 degrees Celsius and then converts to green. Uh, the final color in the glass industry, they say at what color does the final color strike? And that's the strike color of the glass. And so this one at the moment looks brown, but as more of that green expresses, I'm expecting it to change. And I can already see that change starting right there. Um, it's kind of subtle, but, uh, but that's the chrome. It does that unusual change. So. All right, next up we're dealing with uh, Q. Looks like we're pulling from the middle. It's a North Shore Michigan sand, washing soda flux, crushed limestone, uh, and 0.01 cobalt. So this is going to be native iron from the mineral plus cobalt. I don't think we've got iron cobalt yet we've got iron we've got iron copper and we've got chrome cobalt cobalt so this will be cobalt plus native iron in the in the uh, sand so q q2 pulling from the middle right okay yeah i'm going to put it at this position so you might want to be on the well you can you can do it just kind of angle the torch this way it's kind of angled, but it'll be, it'll be fine. There we go. Now watch the crucible back there. Don't, uh... Looks good. All right, so when you're opening the door, just be careful on the uptick. You don't want to uh, let it jar. The reason for that is the inside of this metal is bricked. And if it jars too much, you can actually yeah, you can. Oh, okay. So it, it it hasn't been a big a big issue, but just try to slow it down and smooth to the stop at the top. Okay. Um, we don't want it 
ch chunks of uh, brick, in theory, could come off if it was jarred too much, but we're nowhere near that, but it could. So we'll pour the next one right here. So we're on to our pirate glass. R. So sandbox sand, this is our first example of sandbox sand. Fleet Farm, 90 grams of sandbox sand. Uh, we've got, uh, yeah, washing soda from Fleet Farm, 50 grams. 25 grams dolomite. Chrome and sodium sulfate as a clarifier. We'll see if this one ends up with fewer bubbles than the others because of that clarifier. But this is just chrome with some iron from the sandbox sand. So 0.13 grams of the chrome. So pulling from the left again, R. All right, we're good. Let's grab it. All right, that'll do it. Okay, I think there's four more batches. Is that right? Three or four? Four, four okay. Almost thick enough to let go. There we go. Put a hand in here. Okay, so what we'll do is um, let's transition to this plate and we'll do like a one, two, three, and four might be good to do. So we'll pour this one right here. So next up we've got uh, S. 68 grams of Fisher, Fisher, actually no, I, I noticed there was a transposition error. It's 86 grams of Fisher silica, uh, 52 grams washing soda, 25 crushed limestone, and 0.28 copper oxide. So any residual mineral metal in the limestone plus 0.28, which is kind of a medium high. That should be darker blue, I think, than the other one. Uh, so. S2, and we're pulling from the right. Okay. I'm ready. That looks pretty good. My dwell time was a little too long in the furnace on that one. It got my uh, glove thumb a little bit too toasty, so we'll let that cool off a little bit. It's, uh, to get toasty over here too. Yeah, the, the longer you wait, the more radiant heat you're absorbing. And so sometimes if my first pass doesn't get a good grip on it, I have to reposition. If you look carefully, you'll notice my gloves smoking. Uh, which this is a non-smoking campus. I hope they don't get in trouble. Uh, 
but uh, they do sometimes. So we'll point the stinger that way. Actually, we'll just go ahead and put it over here. This is a heat resistant mica embedded uh, pad on this. So sometimes it burns it a little bit, but not too bad. So my gloves are falling apart, but uh, that's a similar one to number one in a lot of ways. We'll see if that color darkens and turns a bit more blue. This one now is a unique color. That's the, the cobalt. And you'll all be able to see this once we get it on the light table eventually. It, the color shows up a lot better than on steel. But So we'll pour this next one here and just try to angle basically that way. Um, so that was S, right? Okay. So T, North Shore, Michigan Beach Sand, 90 grams, 50 grams washing soda, 24, crushed limestone, 0.1 chrome. So this is a straight chrome, but with uh, Michigan Sand and limestone. Um, and this is center, right? T, T2. And I think, I think we're still focused. So let's go for the next one, T2. There's this crazy little wisp of fiberglass on the opposite side of the crucible. I've not had one, I'm not sure where that even came from. I'm guessing it came from the bubble at one point that popped and somehow, I don't know if you can see it, but there's this little hair, it was like a spider web. But spider webs don't exist at this temperature, so it's like an inorganic spider web. It's a neat idea for a research project, right? No. <laughs> so we'll just go ahead and let that uh, sit over here since we're using more of our plate space today. All right, so this next one, we've only got two more. So let's cast this one here. Yeah, this is this is not the best layout I've ever done. But uh, if we did one here and then one there, and you're going that way, that would that would work thermally. So we'll put it right there. Um, so this next to last, U two, U two. We've got uh, granulosil. That's a purified Minnesota sand. It's a uh, made by a company called Unimin, and it's out of Minnesota, but it's a really high purity, high, high silica sand, 90 grams of that. Sodium carbonate, 50 grams, dolomite, 25 grams, and iron oxide. So this one has pure sand, but intentionally specifically doped iron oxide. So this one should be a nice middle iron green uh, is what we expect with some Minnesota sand. So you two pulling from back, left. Should put on a song by you two as we're doing this one, right? Where did I say I was gonna do that? It's over here, so. There we go, go ahead. Yeah. Failure to plan. It was the 
the one that shattered and the suspicion of the other one that uh, started down that path. But it's it's still managing. They're still still fine. I usually don't like casting so far other over the other batches, but these are actually behaving stable enough that I think we're all right. Oop, catching the pad on fire. Did you see that? Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. This uh, pad actually has a weird smell, kind of like diesel fuel when it when it burns. So that was a little premature to set it on the pad. So we'll let that uh, sit there a little bit. Only got one more, so we'll cast there and just jet the flame so it has enough uh, break space before it would hit the others. So far, that looks kind of yellow, doesn't it? But that will likely strike deeper green as it cools. So keep your eye on that color. It will probably change. So one more right there. Last but not least, we have V2, North Shore, Michigan sand, 95 grams. That's a little higher than normal. 45 grams washing soda, 24 crushed limestone, and our first example of manganese. Purple. The higher silica flux ratio, I'm expecting this one to be a little bit higher viscosity. Not crazy, but probably a little bit higher. And we're looking for purple. Purple, yeah, manganese. All right, this one's easy to find. There's only one left. Yep. A little more sluggish to come out there. Did you see that? And the good news is it's on video, so we can kind of go back and take a look at the dynamics if you're interested. That looks pretty good. Yeah, it's definitely standing up a little more too. So, all right. Did that video of that capturing the real uh, effect of him blowing? Right. That's something that's actually hard to reproduce properly on um, yeah. on on video. It's that's called black body radiation. It's called black body because in and of itself the crucible has no luminescence. It's just the heat and also the density of states of all the electronic transitions available to all these superimposed electron clouds. It leads to a continuous orange glow. This is the same glow that you'd get off of the corona of the sun, hot iron. So that radiation is high intensity in the infrared, and uh, we perceive it as that kind of orangey glow, but uh, it's a, a fairly well understood process called black body radiation. We will touch on that in a uh, later chapter as well. And all my, pontific all my pontificating has uh, led to, I'm now locked, <laughs> locked with that little tongue of glass sticking there. So, all right, so now we'll let this finish cooling. Watch your eyes here. We'll break off that stinger. And we'll let this cool. It takes a while, maybe 20 to 30 minutes for this to reach a temperature where it can be handled. Um, what's that? The, the glass itself. Like right now, this doesn't look particularly hot, but this would be hot enough to fry an egg on right now. Yeah, I don't, that's, that's kind of weird. I, I'm not sure what's, what's causing that actually. 
something in the way it was bubbling, presumably. So we're going to eventually look at internal stress field in the glass. This is the Tuesday section's glass. So we'll put those, uh, actually what we'll do is I've got some previous semester's glass here as well. So we'll set it up so there's glass from previous years. And so you can go ahead and grab that paper and just sit off to the side if you would. And then this is Tuesdays. Of course, yours is way better. Uh, we did lose three batches. Those are the remnants there. Um, but we're going to look at internal stress. Let me give you a quick uh, illustration of that. So this is cross polarizers. Have we studied cross polarizers before? Uh, the weird thing about these is that if you hold them parallel, it just looks like plastic film. But if you hold these perpendicular, I can turn on and off the light going through it, you know, like a, like a switch. And the reason for that is there is an orientation of, in this case, it's probably stretch-oriented polymer film. You can do it with other methods as well. But it only lets light go through that's vertically polarized. Well, if you have vertical polarization going through this, and then you're horizontally po polarizing the other one, you get nothing going through. So this is like an optical switch. It's very useful for things like screens, controlling color, uh, LCD screens worked off this principle, quartz displays. In this context, though, the cool thing about it is that if you have crossed polarizers that are defaulting to dark to begin with, and then you put in something that has an internal stress field or preferential orientation, you can see stress inside the glass. So I'll turn this so that it's at the darkest position, but once you get your chance to take a look at your glass, you just kind of rotate this, and you'll see bands of color and waviness around the edge that is the fingerprint, the signature of that internal stress field. So I'm not sure if you can probably not see it where you're standing there, but we'll go ahead and leave that one on. Once these are cool enough, we'll get them all on the light table and you can take a picture of the internal stress field. But that will come into play when we're discussing uh, tempered glass and Prince Rupert's drops eventually. So anyway, I'm going to show a couple of videos. So thank you for all your help. Uh, those of you who were on duty here. So as that cools, we can look at a couple different contexts of glass work. camera on the glass so we can see any shattering that may or may not occur. At this point, we're actually looking pretty good. Uh, so, So has anybody ever been to a uh, glass blower, art glass? Seen a couple of those, yeah. That shows, yeah. It's uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, we're basically just making glass samples here, but uh, once you start actually making things out of the glass as a a medium, it's uh, it's amazing some of the things that they come up with. One of the most widely well-known um, glass artists, his name is uh, Dale Chihuly. Maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't. Uh, but this next piece we're gonna watch is a video, it's about 20 years old. So the, the, the resolution isn't perfect, but this was kind of a heyday of uh, Dale Chihuly's grad school in art making or in glass making. Uh, 
So this was a little bit on the Discovery Channel that I found on a VH tape when I came here. And I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. Apparently, it's kind of part of the tradition of this class is that you watch one of, one of his videos. And so this kind of has a retro vibe, but it also explains some pretty relevant parts. Uh, they'll be using Fahrenheit temperatures where we've been setting Celsius. They also, I'll just point out here, are going to make shapes out of glass and then they seem in a rush. The reason they're in a rush is that they have to put that glass in an annealing oven. So if this is the softening point of glass, there's a lower temperature called the strain point. At the strain point, it's not melted but there's still enough thermal energy for bonds to rearrange. So that internal stress is caused by quenching it in a sprung, spring position. If you're above strain point, it can just break bonds with that particular one, and bond with something closer, and that rearrangement relieves the stress. This is called annealing the glass. So after all the hot work, you would then hit the annealing uh, temperature that way it relieves that stress so we wouldn't ever see glass exploding like it does here. We're quenching the glass. So anyway, you'll, you'll see some of those themes in, uh, in the video here. There might be political ads. I'm sorry. Uh, it's YouTube. So let me patch the sound quick. Okay, we're at the Boathouse, Dale Chihuly's studio and home in Seattle, Washington. Um, this is where Dale's work is made and where we conduct most of the, the business. I will say, Dale Chihuly, he's an interesting looking character. He's got an eye patch. I used to think it was because he must have had an accident with the glass. It, it wasn't that, it was a car accident. But he's kind of got this Bob Ross hairdo jumping off, but he's actually really amazing uh, and well respected. This is his grad student, but here in a minute he'll pop on and he's been an interesting appearance. If he does, uh, this is the hot shop where we have hot glass. We first met Joe, who was telling us a little bit about why Seattle is so good for glass blowing, and it's because its climate is not too hot, not too cold. Our glass is 2150 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's the working temperature of the glass. In order to melt it, we put it on what's called high fire and it goes up to 2,500 degrees to melt it. So we should take a trip to the furnace. Okay. That's, uh, That's a statement I never really expected to hear. Oh, no. We're going to take a trip to the furnace. Trip to the furnace. So what are you doing now? Well, I'm going to gather this, what we call a little gather here. And I'll, you know, the pipe kind of heats up as we stick it in the furnace there. Wow. So we have this little device to, to keep ourselves from burning ourselves on the pipe. Turn, and then you kind of let it fall on center. There you go. It, it cools off. Yeah. There you go, see? Natural, that's the right, hang it down and it'll, it'll go down. Is that, is the burn unit nearby? We, we have a little device over there that, that catches us into the fire department. Kind of come out. Yeah. And then you lift it on out of there. Okay. Up and out. Lift, lift. There you go. Keep turning. Keep, wow. Good. Keep turning. Good. Right now. There you go. Uh, there you go. Now, this is the marver. This is what we call the marver, and now you are marvering. Marvering. Marvering the glass. Marver is just heavy metal? Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. Very good. Oh, and th this is a good shot coming up here, too. With the, This is what we call a roller wrap. We'll return to Foster in just a second. Oh, they're applying the red to it? Right. Yeah. And these rollers are offset, so it, the bubble moves down and the color goes on it. It's like taffy. Hale yeah. founded it. Oh, he did? Yeah. Yeah. He was the, the founder of the school. So is he like the main glass man in Seattle? He's about the main glass man in the world. Really? Yeah. yeah. I was going to school here at the University of Washington and uh, was taking a degree in interior architecture. Mm -hmm. Started getting interested in glass, started melting glass, and one night I blew glass out of a little kiln. And then from there I decided I wanted to be a glass blower. Well, we're, we're, what we're working on today are these wall pieces, okay? And 
Now, once you see it, you see a dark bubble on the inside? Yeah. That's actually an air bubble with a thin layer of color. That bennet right there is about to drop on to the pipe. We're going to just reheat it, shape it, and with my great team, we'll hopefully get it in the box. So, <laughs> oh, just stay out of your way. Should we, where should we no, be? No, I don't want you to stay out of your way. I want you to get right in my I'm going to have you, actually have you help me a little bit here. Martin works for me, but he also works on his own work and has his own exhibitions. And many of the glass boys that have worked with me have gone on to develop their own careers. Some of them, like Martin's, you know, stay around and still work for me. Others go out on their own entirely. Mm -hmm. But there are some, I don't know if anybody told you, but there are some, something like 50 glass shops now, uh, glass furnace uh, studios in the Seattle area. It's not really glass blowing, it's more like glass shaping. But there's a lot of prep work into shaping the bubble, and very little blowing. Okay, well, glass blowing is difficult to get started in because you have to have the equipment. So you've got an initial alloy of you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars is to have a small glass shop, and then to run it costs a couple thousand bucks a day. Actually, what you're gonna do, what you're gonna do is, these are wooden paddles, and they're to protect me from the heat. Okay. All right. Teamwork. Hey, hey. you guys are awesome. Oh wow, I can't believe you can even talk. Turn. Cap. Oh my gosh. Should it be okay for you? Wow. You can shoot. Well, yeah, shoot my chin, my chin. Stop lying. All right, good. Level. Tip up. Right here. Don't stop lying. Right. This climate is conducive to glass blowing because it's not too hot. You know, the, the, the only really bad, bad climate for a glass blower is a hot one. When you blow glass, you, you blow the bottom of the vessel first. And now we're going to break it off the blowpipe. Okay, cool. Glass always breaks the coldest spot. Right? So it's a little drop of water here, drop of water there. Yes. Oh, wow. There it is. Dude. Is that cool? What you saw down there was those techniques have been used for 2,000 years. We just make you get in. Good. Now push down. Okay. Good. Hit the left pad with one paddle. Good, man. You are on the ball. No, I'm just pushing down. Push, push harder. Even push it. harder now. Yeah. Ease into it. Push harder. Push. Let them open up. Good. Push, 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 push. All right, now when it starts to feel like it's not moving anymore, that's, you're done. We've got as much work on that heat as we could. Now come out. Good job. Whoa. These were nice. fire. And that so it went up. Full heat, Carl. So could you see what color that glass is? Can you tell? It's kind of a light purple. Well, that's, that's true. Uh, but you can tell as it's cooling there, that's a, a purple glass. I can tell if that's a manganese dope glass. So far, everything they've been doing is science, but this next piece, it's definitely going into art. This is not normal glass manufacturing, what you're about to see. They're going to use centrifugal force to open this thing up by spinning it at some crazy speed. So just imagine if there were little blobs that were flying off. This is a now transition. All right, I'll take those. Okay. So we got that. That was good. We got about two heats left. Okay. What we're doing now is we're going to peel this ball open flat to make the wall piece. Sometimes you wonder if you run out of good ideas. <laughs> Glass. 
science is a lot like water. You know, there's a lot of, I like water, I like glass, I like ice. There's a lot of characteristics. And it also kind of works like the ocean, makes forms like the, you know, there's, there's some connection between all of that. So I end up blowing glass and stuff, everything. Half the stuff I make looks like it comes out of the ocean, mm -hmm. even if you don't want it to. I like the rain. It's it's really I find it conducive to thinking. And I always tell people, if you had to write a book, you know, you want to go to the Caribbean to write the book, or you want to go to Ireland, which is a lot rainier than Seattle. And where are they going to write the best book? Even most people admit it's going to probably probably be Ireland. Somebody is an aspiring glass boy, Where do they want to go? They want to move to Seattle because here we've got you know, more glass activity than anywhere else. I mean, Venice has more uh, glass factories and furnaces in Seattle, but we're second to Venice. And, um, and I, I think I would be proud to say that we probably have more glass artists. uses less energy than producing metal or plastic, and it can be endlessly recycled. Whether they're coloured or clear then, glass bottles and jars are always green. The recipe for glass combines several natural raw materials. The main ones are silica sand, soda ash and limestone. Silica sand usually makes up about 45% of the batch. The soda ash helps melt the silica evenly. 
it makes up about 15%. A limestone content of about 10% makes the finished glass more durable. These ingredients are combined with recycled glass called cullet. The factory's equipment feeds precise amounts of the materials into a furnace. After 24 hours at 1500 degrees Celsius, a gooey liquid that's the consistency of honey is produced. The molten glass pours out of the furnace. Shears cut the flow at precise intervals to produce cylindrical globs. Each glob is the exact amount required to make up one bottle or jar. They drop to a device called the scoop. The scoop moves them to troughs that feed them to jar forming and bottle forming machines. A glob of molten glass goes into a preliminary mold. Matter of seconds, it comes out as a miniature version of the bottle, known as a parison. Each parison then moves into a blown mold, the cavity of which is the shape of the final bottle. The equipment blows compressed air into the parison, stretching the glass outward towards the wall of the mold cavity. This process creates the final bottle shape and hollows out the inside. These are amber-colored beer bottles. The color is produced by adding small amounts of iron, sulfur and carbon to the glass mix. A similar manufacturing process is used to produce other types of bottles and jars. In this run, the company is making 375 milliliter wine bottles out of clear glass. This run is producing bottles also out of clear glass. This mold though has a special feature, a recessed insignia on one of the walls, which produces a raised insignia on the front of the bottle. After the bottles leave the forming machine, they travel through flames. Otherwise, they would cool down too quickly and crack from thermal shock. A loader now gently pushes the bottles into what's called an annealing layer. The bottles cool at a controlled rate as they move through the layer. This gradually releases the stress from the glass. As the bottles exit, they're sprayed with lubricant. This enables them to move smoothly through the rest of the inspection and packaging line. The bottles now single file to head into the automatic inspection station. As the machine spins each bottle, cameras and probes check for imperfections such as cracks or bubbles. Inspection equipment then examines the top to check dimensions and ensure the threads for the screw cap are molded correctly. Before shipping, each bottle gets a final visual inspection. The proportion of collet in glass can be as high as 90%. Collet melts at a lower temperature, so for every 10% of collet in the mix, the factory uses up to 2.5% less energy to produce its glass. Now that is a clear incentive to recycle. slightly hurts. We're getting closer. These are still too hot to touch. Uh, so why don't we do this? Uh, it's probably another 10 minutes that so we're going to need to cool down. Uh, but you
you could still go ahead and start taking your preliminary ruler measurements. Uh, just avoid picking the glass up. Uh, but you can go ahead and get your ruler lengths. And then after a few more minutes, we'll uh, transfer over to the light table so we can get a better assessment of the color and internal stress. But I'd say we can go ahead and, and move on to this next phase. It shouldn't be melting the rulers anymore. So rulers are up there. And uh, we can go ahead and get those measurements. Yeah. Oh, there you are. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. It was pretty close. So just take your centimeter length and multiply by 10. Oh, yeah. That's 5.7, 75 millimeters. Yeah. 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 Y
Probably be it. Dark green, dark blue, and dark green for the next three. It's like the white blue, dark green. The last two are like in between green and yellow. More like yellow, so. Six 
Okay. So we can get the the Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's not going back terrible. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. It's not It's not terrible. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. Says, well, that's the weight. Oh, that's yeah. the total weight. Oh, I mean, what was this? This is the cobalt ones, right? Scroll up. Yeah, and that was only going to use 0.1 grams. Yeah, so it's 50 ish. Yeah, but like, are you putting both of them? Because these are 2%. And 2% ions. Well, yeah, but I think Into this one, see that that CO layer is CO. you take your uh, sheets up here, let me take a picture of that one patch. CO2 plus is 0.09. Oh, man, oh, 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 and the next one is CU2 plus comma. Oh, God. Yeah. 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 Uh, so this one had added copper and iron. Now, for some of the batches, there is an unknown amount of iron. Sure, I think it's for those, there is iron present. Yeah. So this is only for oh. that. Oh. That particular batch did add a point. Yes, yeah, so see our copper. Oh, no way. Yeah. So what is it called? Oh. Yeah. All right, next one. Uh, thank you. C 
CO2 plus and CR3 plus. Oh. You have told me about how it's busted up. Or maybe it wasn't. Just say maybe. Because he always says how it's busted up. It shouldn't be the container. I, I believe you, but I just wonder if it's. Uh, What's up? Um, point zero zero six. Tip. 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 CU2 plus. What is the thing? No, 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 what's the point zero five one? But what's the actual thing? CR3 plus. Tip Alright, so all we gotta do is. How many of you? Or no. How are you guys? You guys said you're numbering your viscosities 1 through 10? Yeah. And there's 11 of them, so you're not like comparing them to each other. You just kind of no, compare them. Like sure. You yeah, so that other group did use the Fisher purified silica. So that's a clue. What's the highest? That's an important so it seems like with the the and the coordination complex that manganese is supposed to do in glass. That's the question. Why is that? I also everywhere in the compositions I got yellow. None of the stuff that we're adding is supposed to be yellow. So that's from something so in the same itself. So apparently I've got some 16, unknown 16, metals in the same that are Alter the color color. Color. So, so that's a result. I mean, yours is also well, no, green like instead of purple. It's it's green. Green. So, so these appear to be cool enough to move over. So I'm going to go ahead and move these over to the light table. Hopefully, we'll still treat them with a degree of respect. They still. Right, you can crack over here. Over I did have one blow up in a cabinet in my office a year, a full year after we had cast it. So it, uh, what's that? All right. Yeah. I had to go back and edit all those papers. Uh, as they age, Common to get a, what's called a side spall, so uh, a ring of glass will flake off the side. You might be able to see that in a few of the samples that are out there. Uh, Yeah, go. Oh, no, it is. 
is straight up lead pipers. So, 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 so usually not, but in some cases so after they leave the well, the first are still interested that it's possible that we could have some of them disappear. I've been talking about for years, but I just think it worked out for a healing protocol where I can see usually you don't let it keep all cool all the way down. You would let it cool down and then put it in a moving mode. But I want to see if I can take post stress glass, slowly reheat it back up, right. hold it, and then drop it back down and stabilize the glass. Uh, then I could make these. <laughs> This one with the encapsulated, uh, encapsulated aluminum is still stable, so hopefully, hopefully that will survive. It just has a very, uh, you want to see the color of the stretch, you can come up here now and uh, visualize the glass in the light table. They definitely have interesting stress fields. Is that the same? Sure, uh, the polarizer. Is that for, for you, is for number three? Did you do like the type of sand you use? Uh, you can also take your batch record and the first you include that in your lab report. Those are available here. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, yeah. 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 If you have it already. Yeah. What was it? The other sheet. Yeah. 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 Oh, I don't think so. I think it was just ingredients. Oh, actually, it's a little bit of sheet. Which ingredients are the Yeah, so that one. Go on, so you try what? Actually, oh, wait, well. No, you're right. Washing soda. I did have the best for health. So, yeah, it's sodium. Yeah, it's sodium. Yeah. 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 All right, right the chemical reaction can change the flux using the chemical reaction from the carbonate to the next So I think it did it have a stable if so what was it? No, don't forget some ingredients and fuck the stable. Yeah, so we have also carbonate. We also had a wash and stove. Oh, yeah, that's... Our modifier, any other than those listings that we use in the body? Yeah. What was the function of the other? The only modifier we added... Oh, we added... Iron oxide. Iron oxide. And... Can we add something else? Oh, is this a modifier? Just do iron oxide. Yeah. And what was the function? Yeah. Uh, it was just the fire change. We didn't have so much so much Thank you. 
General question about the what would be the effect on the part of the if the amount of color is going to increase? This study figure out what the color is. Yeah, it's football and color. And so I went ahead and relabeled these so it would be less than years. State the general principle describing the relationship between the amount of flux and fiscal elastic range. So the more flux you add, the more less fiscal. Which of the 
Oh, because to be honest, this is like the the yeah. I'd like to get that person back in my so Oh, yeah. There's the. Uh, uh, this one actually said that, like, with, with yeah, lithium is over the here, the this top is top sodium, top and top this would be potassium over here. You need for the temperature, just so like as the temperature increases, it gives lithium and it's just shifts. Yeah. Um, yeah. What? Which one's having forward and lower? Yeah. Yeah. Would that mean it's almost like a So it's like the So it's like the So this has higher negative seven unit. Yeah, I believe. I remember you guys doing. Yeah. What are you changing? You use sodium for the whole thing, right? I think, I think everybody Everybody, that's what you said. Yeah. yeah. I think it's going to be a little bit out right here. It shows up like the lithium plus the dollar. Right, right. Yeah. But I'm going to be a little bit out of the way. You want to do 12 or 13? Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know. I The higher the temperature it has to be to get the same as the What are you, what's that? Oh. Oh, uh, 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 Right, we've been talking about that. It's, it's some of the, after it sits for a while and becomes stable, it's, it's possible. Uh, usually we don't, but um, usually because they do become a shatter hazard uh, since they can randomly break up to months later. But after a few weeks, it becomes pretty unlikely. Sure. Um, but there still is a terrible threat. I want to work out a protocol that makes them stable. Right, so yeah, it would probably be setting a lower temperature on a separate furnace. And ideally, we could still do the analysis, but then we would load it back into a furnace, heat up, hold overnight, and go down slowly. Great. Yeah. Does, uh, does it need, like, work if you have that higher time? It wouldn't have to be. Uh, 
Uh, for instance, you know, the Tipper class is first made in the with a very small stress field that's intentionally and yields not have that stress field. But then you can put hot zones or carefully engineered cool rates that are engineered to induce stress in the glass. That's how safety glass works. Cars, this is actually we have to say how it We have to have safety glass. Right, it shatters the little pieces instead of the big jagged pieces. It's also safety glass that shattered from small squares, but it's also glued to the big ones. It's actually hot like clay to this rubber interlayer, so it does hold it together. It's hard to crack the windshield. You crack the whole lot of it. I have seen profoundly crack the windshield that are all caved in. In that case, it's often still like you've got to put a black bag in. You can get through it. It's bulletproof. They do make multi ply where they just keep going. Glass, glass, plastic, glass, plastic, like the beast or the president did. Crazy thick. And. There are actually yeah, some more and really this larger bullet and glasses that will uh, stop bullet this way, but you can return fire and you go through. So in that case, the bad guy is trying to shoot you, and he can't get through, but you can shoot back and return fire through the glass. So they've got one way ballistics glass. It's really cool. Yeah. Assuming you installed it correctly. Right. Don't install it the wrong way. And would be the now they can shoot you, but you can't shoot back. That's even worse. <laughs> yes. So it is a thermal decomposition, so you can just write yeah. above the arrow to the swim uh, in the okay. mile there and uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, so in gen cam, that's called a decomposition uh, reaction because uh, one thing falls apart in two. NA2O is the way you balance the charge of sodium oxide and plus CO2. You can see that that O plus CO2 makes CO3, and that's the carbon atom. All right. The internet said that, but I was like, I'm not sure. Yeah, so that's that's a process called calcining. Okay. And the little bubbles that you see in the glass are carbon dioxide left over from that reaction. You leave it overnight, most of it gets out, but in a commercial glass setting, it actually weld way longer to find find the glass uh, all the bubbles on. You don't want bubbles in your windows. No. That, that's a defect that actually can result in scrap the whole thing. I think there's a certain critical number of microscopic bubbles that are allowed, but any large bubbles, that's they, they don't allow that. So this, this will still have lots of bubbles. How do you get rid of the bubbles? You just have to heat it to a higher temperature and let it sit longer, and they eventually rise to the top, but it's super thick stuff, so it takes a while. Yeah. But overnight, at the very beginning, it actually is kind of weird because you can stand here, uh, so you can hear it popping, and since it's so thick, it's a it's this it's this weird like it's a louder pop because it's a viscous medium. But you, you can literally hear those bubbles forming in the glass and popping. Uh, it's possible to heat them in the vacuum or the bubble. Yeah, that if you if you vacuum heated it, you can clear those bubbles a lot faster because then they would immediately grow into that vacuum. 
And that makes it higher. So if we vacuum the gas in this, much like they do castable metals, um, that would get there a lot faster. Commercially, though, like the glass plant in town, they have a, a furnace that's probably about the size of this classroom yeah. house. Yeah. And it's, it's full of about two or three feet of glass. And as they can be the melt in, they've got this bubble that sends a intentionally compressed air bubble that make a bubble field that causes that side of the furnace to have this like swirling motion on this back half that are feeding it in that goes like this. And they've done calculations such that only after a certain I've critical amount of time is it able to go past the bubbler and it holds it in the furnace to find the glass so that by the time it reaches where it casts out onto molten tin and casts glass on a tin bat, there shouldn't be any bubbles left. So that's the way it's accomplished. But vacuuming would work. Yeah. For some things it works for a glass furnace, there's the logistics. Yeah, it depends on how fast you come that furnace. But you're feeding things in the other side. That's the problem. Vacuum or has the air locks. So with a, a crucible, but for metal casting, it's pretty easy. You just have your vacuum jacket that you just shove on top, pump the air out, and you're done. That batch is not done in a continuous process. If you do that, this glass is continuous. You'd have to have airlock doors instead of a, a crucible and seal and unseal and seal and unseal. So there's some logistics issues with vacuum applications. It still can be done, but usually not on a continuous ribbon. They uh, break it into pieces, and that piece then goes through an oven or a vacuum process where a door shuts behind it and as it's still going through on some kind of a conveyor, it's like a handoff conveyor that yeah, the airlock comes up, this one curves under but feeds it onto the next one that curves under, the airlock closes and now it's traversing through the vacuum conveyor system. It would, but there's Air, like there is actually a process like this in curtain glass where they do sputter coating and they do have this vacuum conveyor so they'll have an airlock zone that they can pump down quickly so the door opens it goes in airlock zone and then after that reaches a certain pressure the next one opens up so that it's less of a burp of air in the actual sputter chamber so they do that for staging so that it yeah the amount of gas left in the final stage is minimal. Uh, so, oh yeah, yeah. This is all manufacturing engineering. Split second timing to make it all perfect. I have time to walk through one of the parker factories. I've got him to walk through the plastic product to explain it. My fireworks fall in control. Okay. okay. Yeah, you think about what you're making with that. If it's five dollars a piece, well, fifty cents a piece. Well, we're just a little higher to the right. Five cents a piece. At least like that's a very beautiful. Well, that might be. Well, they're almost on the road, but I'll tell you the problem is we didn't have any press for you. Yeah, so the question is just a second. I got my Bible press. I'll have a set press around. What do you do? A little to the right. Yeah. I think it's between tabs. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, as long as you end up with a, with a PDF, yeah, the, the uh, intro type material doesn't have to stay there. So in, in theory, you could just delete that part and just submit the data and questions. But it's, if it's two documents, it's okay. Do it that way. I prefer it as one. But 
is if you can combine it, and I, I did circulate those instructions that showed some different options of how to do that. I saw that. That's, I'd probably use that if I had it written down on paper. And yeah. Just upload it as a PDF. But if this is easier for you, just to drop it in. Yeah, you can just substitute the intro for your cover report and then sprint it to a PDF. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how they have the whole warehouse of the leftover tools from all the years? Yeah. How much are all those worth? Yeah, you don't want to. Yeah, and some of those are so specific that there may not be another use for it outside of these original manufacturing operations. Yeah, so sometimes they're like, well, oh, we're in your first inventory. We asked the person if they wanted to keep the tool, and they said no, so we threw it out. And three months later, they pulled us the dollar and we reversed the tool. And we showed them the document, and they're like, what happened? Yeah, so now they are more hesitant to uh, throw away the tool. 3M uh, is one of his bigger customers. Yeah. And uh, from what I've heard, he said they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Well, sometimes companies get so big that they'll be left hand, right hand. You know, this person makes a decision that contradicts this other person. Yeah. And, and often it's the, you know, management and the bean counters are making decisions like, yeah, that project's canceled. And the people here know, well, maybe, but if we're already selling it, we got to support that customer because it's under contract. Well, that project's canceled. Well, we're already selling it. And so you might get crosstalk. Because companies like that get so big that not everybody necessarily knows they're on the same page. You, you know what? Just keep everything yeah. until it's yeah. not been used for 50 years. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait five or 10 years. Yeah. Until all of our uh, whatever contracts have been expired and then we exactly. don't make a decision. No, our problem. So that that's a nightmare, though, when a few months pass and they're like, oh, wait, you already threw that away because you needed that. So what do you do then? That's just millions of dollars out the window. Is what it is. And they about another couple of weeks to make the part. Oh yeah, lost time, lost product. No maintenance overnight. Well, these are all good life lessons. To now, I, I probably take it too far the other way. I hold on to stuff. I've got little remnants of projects, you know, lurking in every corner of the lab because I never know when to finally call it. But. Uh, uh, I have the system I have where I have put pay on everything and it's just, okay. Just want to if keep. it's been long enough, yeah. Now there, I have, I don't always stay on top of it because that does involve me taking time to actually get rid of stuff so sometimes I just have that file that yeah. grows. It's like the, the, the trash bin on your computer, right? It just fills up until eventually you figure out it's time to I know I even really looked at it. Half yes, the sir. time I just know. Yes. Right, we should probably get yeah. some pictures. Of ours? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I definitely have stacks of paper in there. Yeah, I've, I've got all these lab reports in my office. It's like, wow, that's, that's from 2016. Cool. Actually, oh, well, that's from 2014. Just to see. Like, that was a while ago, wasn't it? So, I have a few projects where I have a so I would do these rather large projects for a few games on them. I kept a lot of the files because that's like, oh, it's a sentimental value. Okay. So the same thing, how does this ever come in handy? No, it's just a conversation. He says, yeah. That's digital, right? So as yeah. long as you've got storage, you can always just put it in the archive of digital folders. Well, a lot of these files are about half a megabyte big. Yeah, so those, who cares? That goes all up. project maybe is about half a gig. Yeah, it's it's like large video files. Like I've got terabytes worth of lecture videos. So after I upload it to YouTube, I eventually do scrap my initial videos, but then I I, I download playlists in the compressed MPEG format not the editable original format because that lectures from anywhere between a single lecture can be anywhere between four and forty gigabytes. So the entire class ends up being about between two hundred and four hundred 
gigabytes. So you can see how it all starts really adding up. But I after it's been compressed, I can put the past 10 years worth of lectures on a single 128 right. well, gigabyte thumb drive. Cool. So all this data management eventually becomes a crushing issue. Yeah. I know I do, I did video editing for a while because I have a little tutorial series for people mm -hmm. and how it suggests how to improve gameplay for a video game. Sure. I do a lot of game Very theory true. of studying how people re react to a mechanic and whatnot. Anyways, I do know what you mean by you just get these large videos that just take up stacks and stacks and then I was like, okay, how do I make the digestible for your everyday viewer who wants to be entertained for every second <laughs> yeah. of watching this because if it's not entertaining for 30 seconds, they're That's just it. They're gone. So they have to stand all the props and other things and then spend hours upon hours like just doing like a 30 second day. It reminds yeah. me of so oil stickers. Obviously, oh. I'm not making high production quality yeah. videos. Yeah, I'm yeah. just like doing open mic just oil mostly oil for uh, review. That's one of my main purposes. It's a fallback, you know. So, but in theory, you could make all these little five-minute snippets and edit it all down and make it more like deliverable. But these are mainly only for my, my students. But yeah, for, for things you're trying to appeal to a, a general audience, there has to be all this entertainment factor too. I was. I know it's not made this, but I came to this conclusion. A video has one rule about how long you can make it, about 8 to 10 minutes. Anything above that, and you're really probably too long. Yeah. Directing your attention to have your short, movie audiences. Yeah, that's why, you know, the whole shorts that they use for, uh, it's like crack for your brain. Uh, it's like a and and it stuff. just, it never ends. So people will suddenly just fall into a hole for three hours and they watch 400 videos and it's like nothing even happened. You know, they, they don't even remember realize time, any of all the time passes. So. Well, TikTok blew up for a reason. It's and like then a everyone trance. tried to copy yeah. like some part of it to profit off of that. But you're in a hypnotic trance for hours. And why? You could, exactly. You could be they're doing. paying for ads and they're making money off of engagement. You could be yeah. doing so, something. The, so the longer that you're entrapped in the, the YouTube shorts or the TikToks or the Instagram reels, whatever it is, the longer, the more engagement they get out of you, the more ads they can reel in based on general engagement time per person. Yeah. So then, yeah, so they're designing the algorithms to try and get you to stay longer and do it more frequently. They Tell me. So it's all mind control. Absolutely. They don't like me because I use Adblock, so I don't get it from ad money. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I use I always use Adblock too. Like I would just die without it. Well, and then the other thing I do is I look for the longer videos that I try to talk about stuff in depth. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm trying to study game theory in the background to understand human psychology. Yeah. They'll just recommend you the most random garbage, and they're like, well, I don't want to see that. Stop showing me that. Like, this keeps happening. Mm -hmm. I just don't even want to pay attention to the algorithm. Just <laughs> type stuff up into the search bar. Yeah. Now, I don't know that I, I do kind of browse down there to see what they have. Most of the time, it's like, no. I haven't realized it. That's today's a news article. Oh, okay. Eventually they try to figure you out. Oh, this is horrible news. Why'd you show me this? <laughs> you know, we're just not going to put anyone new to us. Got my calculator this time. Oh, Yay. good. <laughs> Have a good weekend. I'm not yeah. going to be in class tomorrow, but see you next week. Okay, sounds good. We'll see you later.
Yeah, in general, it's a little too versatile. So, what to find yourself? I remember back in uh, grade school, there was a student who won't use a calculator because you're not going to have access to them all the time. And I got the middle school where I was saying maybe you can start to be not allowed to phone. So, I got a bit further and it was just okay, fine, you will have a computer, but you'll have to know all the answers in the world. Yeah. It's just kind of funny how that I saw that progression. I'm I'm 25, so I go a little bit further back than most people. Yeah. It's interesting to see. You know, yeah, it is. It's now becoming sort of a default tool. Yeah, it's not part of my system. It's like I get it. You have all the answers there, but at the same time, you don't because you don't know what you're looking at. If you can't process it, how how is this helping you? Well, and search is only good for disconnected facts. You actually have to apply judgment and experience. You can't get that from search. No. So that's why the goal is to exercise judgment in scenarios where, in the real world, search doesn't work. So. Yes, it's so much with my predatory approach that I did where I was making all that stuff for 10 seconds. You don't just Google, how do I make a factory? Right. No, no, no. You have to know how to assimilate and describe all these components, and steps. Yes, and how do you figure out all the, like, oh, we need, I don't know, iron ore. Where do we find iron ore? Okay, now how do I program this into the computer? Yeah, reality is a, a bit more messy than just uh, looking at Wikipedia pages and getting a handful of facts. So. Yeah. Oh well. well That's our world, yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah, class tomorrow. Sounds good. Can you make this up? You actually did forget your calculator? No, <laughs> not my calculator. <laughs> my headphones. Oh. Be hiding. I just let it some out right here and then maybe Morgan can grab them. Okay, well, thanks. Yep, we'll see you later.